allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Karen, I got that sign, and Bob has a key from Kathy Jewell. Yeah. And you gave him the key, okay. And I used the paper sign. Thank you. And he gave me the key.
five minute phone call would get rid of 50% of the aggravations because it may be a nonsense crime or misdemeanor, but to the person it's happened to, it's the center of their life at that time. And just a, a call, <coughs> feedback, would eliminate an awful lot of the communities that get aggravated. And we don't seem to do that. Um, it was very noticeable, if you remember last old home day, there was a policeman down there, I don't even know his name, mixing it with kids and handing out little badges and chatting. Not in a law enforcement sense, but he certainly connected. And I had currently, at that time, I had visitors from three countries that were bowled over by this, but never seen anything like it. I also found out that that officer, whoever he was, did that off his own back. He bought these little badges, please. It presented the policeman to the community in an entirely different light. Not as a guy with a big gun, bulletproof vest and all the rest of it. It's inevitable there's a, a distance between either military or police if you're armed to the teeth. There's automatically, I don't care who you are, there's a barrier. And if you can break that down and get out and about in the community, I think it's safer for the police. And indirectly, they will learn an awful lot about what's going on. And there'll be very visible, much more visibility. Even though we don't have many officers, if they're out and about, that one says that they're almost actively discouraged for chatting up people. He, he did that at school with the meeting too, and when he went to present one of the little girls with the badge, he said, now the, to take this badge, you have to promise to be good. She says, I can't promise that. <laughs> he said, well, you're honest, so as long as you promise to be honest. <laughs> no. But yeah, it did. It makes a big impact on the kids. Yeah, and it's like chucking a brick into water. It, it spreads, and as I say, an awful lot of the interaction between the community and the police can be solved, um, and go in a very positive way. I also happen to think, even in Barnstead, rural Barnstead, police can walk into a really bad situation. It, you know, it happens. The more knowledge they're getting from the community, the safer it is for them. No question about that. So, but as I say, it's not going to be a quick process, it's clear. But I think we can start going down the right track and I welcome your efforts. I noticed, by the way, it said about community, I don't particularly want to, but I would recommend, if you are looking for members of the public, with Mr. Glassman here and Paul Vince, neither of whom are connected to any particular group in town. And certainly Paul Vince has got a very good external legal type mind. He can be real useful. Um, so if you go at some stage in the future, um, they're two people I think will be very viable. I haven't mentioned it to either of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know what to do. And thank you very much. Well, you do know that you're on the seven towns in the end. The seven towns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know what yeah. my next meeting is, but... No, I'll get an email from... Let me know. The guy at San Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, some public... Julie's Parsons. I just have a, a few things to say. I commend you for following through on my challenge. You're doing a good job. I enjoyed being at your work session tonight and thinking you're making a lot of headway. I did have a couple of comments <coughs> listening to you, though. Um, one of the things I understand your job descriptions are coming. And an evaluation has to have a job description. What an evaluation is, you have given them assigned duties and you grade them in one form or another as as um, James has said, that can
can be a number system, whatever, just writing down, yes, they are following through, no, they are not. But if you don't give them a job description, you have nothing to evaluate them on. Because they don't know what they're doing, and you don't know what they're doing. The goals are the end part of an evaluation. After you've gone through the evaluation, you set the goals. Is he going to correct his shooting? Is he going to strive to get more classes? Whatever. Your chain of command, as a supervisor, all of my employees will only come to me. If I do not solve their problem or come to an agreement with them in some way, only then can they go to my supervisor. And my supervisor, the first question is, have you gone to your first supervisor? If they have not seen me, she will not talk to them. She sends them back to talk to me first. That is a chain of command. You do not go above until the bottom one either cannot work out your situation or has worked out. Um, one of the things is the follow through. There have always been complaints about the police department to the selectmen in all the years I've lived here. You do not follow through. You're setting goals for this gentleman. You're setting requirements for this gentleman. You need to have meetings, you need to have reports, you need to have dates set when those things must be done. And if they're not, then you need to follow through and write them up at that point. Some type of punishment. You can't just, you can't set a meeting up with him or tell him he has to do something and then when it doesn't happen, just ignore it. You have to take action. That's what it's all about. Um, the attaboys on the record, that's great. That's really great because it does make the employee feel good and it gives you something to read when you do the evaluation by reading what's on the record. The maintenance schedule, every piece of this town should have a maintenance schedule. The office should have one. Who's taking care of the machines? Are you oiling the shredders? Are you, what's happening with the toners? Are you having a repairman come in and check them out on a periodic basis and do cleaning, whatever else? Everyone should have a maintenance schedule. Chris has worked hard to do his, but it's not impossible. He can tell you anyone can work out a maintenance schedule. And Mary should do it over the police office with the machines and the different things she has. She should have a maintenance schedule. Um, and if, when you require him to do a report or to turn in something to you and he does not, that is insubordination. It's something you can write them up about. Uh, I'm trying to think of the And you talk about not having a boss. The president's got a boss. Because if he doesn't do his job, he's going to be voted out of office. But everybody under him reports to someone in letters. And, it, you know, the selectmen have a job to do. It's to take care of the town and run the town. And in that process, you need to run the departments. It's not micromanage. But give them a description and tell them this is what we want done and work with them on it. So thank you again and I hope you continue to follow through with what you have started. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>
Okay. 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 Um, so currently you do have a program in place and you have testing for your DOT employees at the DPW who tested the rate of 50% for drugs and 10% for alcohol by the end of the year. You have non-DOT fire firefighters that hold a CDL license um, and your police officers and those are in those should be in a pool together because they wanted to test them at the same rates as the DOT. So 50% for drugs and 10% for alcohol will be tested by the end of each year. And then a third uh, consortium we're looking at is your firefighters without a CDL endorsement. And currently they're being randomly selected at a 20% rate for drug testing. I don't think there's alcohol testing. You don't know what's alcohol? You do think it's full? Yeah. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure what you were currently doing. So, um, so we are looking at the three consortiums, uh, and uh, currently your firefighters. I'm not really sure what's going on with the current situation, but um, we would suggest that we move your firefighters into that have the CDL license into a pool by themselves because. Um, actually with the police officers because you wanted them to select at 50% and 10% like the DOT but you can't co-mingle mandated employees and non-mandated employees and firefighters are exempt from the DOT regulations so we need to separate them out but we can still test them at the same rates okay so you would continue to test them um, they would just be in their own separate so you're saying firefighters, police, and the DOT would be in one pool, or the DOT is separate? DOT is separate. And then firefighters yep. is separate? Yeah. Okay. So, to, so two non-DOT pools, one with the CDL license firefighters and the police officers in that one. And then your third one would be the, the non-CDL endorsed firefighters. Yes. Just one question. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry? But that would be inappropriate. Yes. Of course, sir. We also have employees that drive their own vehicles to go to do the town business. Okay. They're included in the pool. Which, okay, so they are, would be added to the 20% group. Yeah, Okay. That's another correction. It was my understanding that all the firefighters, even though they're exempt from they're required by the fire department to get the DL. Right. At least the CDL. That, Wasn't it that if they were driving a, a fire truck that they wanted them to have a CDL license? Yeah. Okay. But then there's other firefighters that don't drive the truck well, because they don't have a CDL. So we still want to randomly test them. Right. Um, anybody that, I mean, you can choose your types of employees to be tested. Um, and let's talk, but we'll talk further down about the policy. Um, so are we square on the three separate consortiums? Okay. So we have a fee to start up your program with us, and it's for 51 plus employees. We have um, tiered groups, so you're in the 51 plus range. Um, and it's $260 to set you up. And then we drop that fee after your first year to $220. Okay, 
so that you have CDL fire. You say, I want those guys tested just like DOT. Okay, there's that group. But I also have firemen that don't have CDLs. I don't really need to test them quite as much. I just want them to know that we're on top of things. Now they're in a different pool. So you have a 50% up here with CDL drivers, non-DOT. Department of Public Works, DOT, all by themselves, non-DOT. So non-DOT can be policemen, firemen that do not drive, or you would decide who could be in that category. Such as your employees driving a company vehicle. Let's say we have, you have an employee that, said that drives a small company truck, town truck. He doesn't have a CDL, but you go, well, he's driving a company vehicle. I want him tested like the firemen that drive the trucks. Put him in that pool. Right. So you can pick on and who goes in those pools. Versus a gentleman that might be mowing along at the cemetery. We don't need to have him tested maybe as much. And these are just examples as the DOT drivers. Yeah. So you have them in the non-DOT pool. So we brought this all back together on the way that this should be put out the way. So there was some issues with the last TPA, but that happens. So that's where Chris came in and asked us to jump in and try to straighten it out and make it look a little better. So I'll let Kim finish. Okay, so consortium fees include happiness available for emergency after hours collections, such as the need for post accident testing. Um, we are basically one of the only companies in this area that is available for you after hours. Right now, your current TPA. Um, is Concord Hospital, and they do not provide after-hour services. So if your guys are out plowing and there's an accident, there's nowhere for them to go to have their drug and alcohol testing done. So a lot of times that happens, and you don't have something set up for it because you've never had the incidents happen before. We are available 24-7 so that if that arises, you're covered. Um, we also will maintain your random selections and provide you with quarter quarterly statistic reports for each of your groups of people so you can see how it's going throughout the year. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you, Chris, do you have um, DOT physicals for your drivers even though you're exempt? Um, I just brought that back up. The first year I was here we did, they lapsed after two years mm -hmm. and kind of do not. Okay. Something that we're going to explore now. Okay. Um, currently, municipalities are exempt from doing DOT physicals, which, like you said, are every two years, depending on the person's health and whatnot. Um, a lot of the municipalities that we currently have also do the DOT physicals anyways. And we keep track of those physical expiration dates so that they don't run out, etc. Right. Well, we have the capability of tracking those expiration dates and letting you know ahead of time before they expire. Yeah, but you don't. You only do the testing. You don't do, have anything to do with physical. You're only reporting that, okay, this, this medical time says you have to get two years. No, we do the physicals too. We have um, a few nurse practitioners that work for us, and they will travel out here to do DOT physicals. They just need a private area. Or they can come into conference to our office where we do physicals in the early mornings, middays, and sometimes at night to accommodate after hour schedules for people. So we do do physicals um, if that's something that you're interested in. But like I said, you're exempt from them at the current time for your DOT employees. But I just wanted to let you know that we do offer that. So let's talk about the policy real quick. One of the DOT regulations is that you have to have a written drug and alcohol policy um, and that everyone has to sign that, of course. And we write policies, we'll come out and interview you, per se, do a questionnaire that will ask you questions like, are you going to work with somebody that tests positive or are you going to terminate them? And we go through a whole set of questions um, and then we take that and we write a custom policy for you. It also has the um, required content that the DOT requires you to have in your policy. Yeah. And that would be for the DOT drivers. 
with your additional firefighters and such that do drug testing, we always suggest that you have a policy for that too because you're gonna run into the same issues with the drug testing program for them as you do with your DOT, possibly. So we can write a combined policy. We just did one for the town of Hancock and that I was very pleased with um, for DOT and non-DOT as well. And what we can write a uh, combined policy for $300. So oh. have you seen the policy you have? I have not. And I would be glad to look over that as well. Because if you do have the required content or if that's all you need to add, that's something that you can do definitely. You, you didn't see the pixel when we talked, we mentioned it briefly. Oh, yeah, we absolutely do. Okay. And we put it before the attorney. Okay. So. Okay. So we'd be glad to look at that for you to see if it has all the information that you have to have. Just for the DOT part, anyways. Um, also, with your DOT uh, employees, there are these small booklets available. They're from JJ Keller, and they give out educational information regarding the drug testing that they're required to do. This is what they look like. And they have an inside cover page where the driver or whoever you want to have can sign it, rip it out, and it can go in a file that they receive educational material on drug and alcohol. That's they're what required, required to give some material. type of educational material to those employees. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about on-site services because this is really important. Currently, you're sending your employees down to Concord Hospital in Concord. So with us, you wouldn't have to send them all the way to Concord or to the nearest collection site. Um, or I don't know if you send them with a supervisor right now. Chris, do you drive down or do you send them on their way? Okay. You send them and send them three hours. Okay. So, so good example, they're gone for three hours. With us, we come over to the shop and we're there for five minutes to see one employee and they're back to work. Um, so it's very convenient. So you're, you're saving a lot of time, your lost production, and um, the pay and the travel time and the gas. Are you sending them in the company vehicle? Most likely. Um, and something that we always don't really like to talk about but it could possibly happen that they're going to try to mask or adulterate the test between when Chris tells them to leave and when they get to the collection site. Um, it is a fact that it does happen. Uh, we hope that it's not your employees, but it's still you are giving them that opportunity <coughs> period of time to try to adulterate the sample on the way to the collection site. So if we just show up here and he says, John, they're here to see you, he doesn't have that opportunity to try to mask or adulterate the test, and that's very important. So five panel drug screens, which is what the DOT requires um, to do, which is test for marijuana, cocaine, PCP, opiates, and amphetamines, that would cost you $105 for us to come out here. But we've decided that if you're gonna do all of your non-DOTs as well with us, that we're gonna set it at $100 per drug screen for on-site for DOT and non-DOT. In our office, those panel, that panel drug screen is $66. Um, what I would like you to keep in mind regarding the five panel drug screen is that it does not test for things like oxycodone, benzodiazepines, methadone, some of the latest and most abused drugs out there are not included in the five panel DOT drug screen. So always keep that in mind when you have maybe a reasonable suspicion and you think that somebody is using and then you go to send them for a DOT five panel drug screen and they come back negative because you didn't test them for what they were using. Um, so for an instance like that, I always go back to the policy and say, hey, let's add in that for post-accident and reasonable suspicion testing, you can test for any drug and you can do any type of a test so that we could actually expand the panel to test for all of these additional substances that are out there that people are abusing. Okay. Now, if you are interested in talking about the wider panels for your non-DOT employees, you can do that. You can test for, for those. You're talking somewhere in the range up to $130 per test when you expand out those additional tests. Um, alcohol testing on site are 66 
dollars. Um, if there's a positive, we have to do a confirmation test in 15 minutes. It's an additional test. And um, like we talked, we talked already talked about the physicals, so that's okay. They're one hundred and seventeen dollars on site, and they're eighty in our office. Yeah. Question: uh, mm -hmm. You draw that your alcohol test is that done by? Uh, well, it can't be done by blood, so. Breathalyzer. Yep. Breathalyzer or saliva. <coughs> yep. Um, we're certified breath alcohol technicians. We have two machines, so that if we have an issue with one, we have a backup. Um, we also have um, miniature breathalyzers that are used for screening tests, typically for randoms. Um, and then if you have a positive, you use the big breathalyzer to confirm it. So it's all, mainly all done by breathalyzer. So positive drug screens incur an additional $55 charge. And this is just because of the time and the medical review officer being involved. Dr. Hefner works for us and he will interview anybody who tests positive. The process is that we do the collection, it goes to the lab, the lab reports it to Dr. Hefner if it's positive, he contacts the donor. So you and I are never notified yet. He contacts the donor, he, it takes, he has specific requirements he has to follow. He has to talk to them, try to get a hold of them three times in the first 24 hours, and so on. Once he connects with them, he will interview them. If there's a prescription involved, then he will take care of that and he'll end up you know, reporting the drug screen to you uh, as the town administrator or whomever is going to be the contact for the town. So because of that, that's where you get the $55 charge that's for the right. For the positive. Extra. Yeah, for a positive. positive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we've just added a service um, to our services that we offer now, and it's for follow-up programs. I don't know if your policy, is your policy termination if someone's positive, or do you work with them currently? So what we will do is if you have someone that tests positive, we will walk you through the steps of what the requirements are, such as setting them up with a substance abuse professional, um, getting them to an educational class, and then they do a return to duty test that has to be negative, and then they're going to have to do a minimum of six follow-up tests in the first year. And that can go on for up to five years. So a lot of times the follow-ups get forgotten about at some point. So we decided that we're going to keep track of them for you and let you know, hey, it's time to send such and such for their follow-up test. So we keep track of all of those for you. And we'll keep track of them all the way through the end of the person's you know, job with you, if they leave, and so on and so forth. <coughs> If you choose to have us come out to do drug screening before 7 in the morning or after 5 at night, which sometimes it's a convenience factor for third shift people, um, there's an additional $25 charge. But it's not per test, it's just a one-time fee. So if we come out and do three firefighters on their night shift, then it will be just the one twenty-five. Sometimes people can't pee on command. <laughs> because of that, we have to wait for them. Because once you start a drug screen process, you can't stop it until you've completed the um, collection. So we give everyone a half hour up front because typically people can go in about a half hour. If it's any time after that, then we charge an hour. I do want to interject on that and say that if we have one person that we're testing, or we have a group of people we're testing, and the first person can't go, so they sit aside and they're drinking their water, and we're going to see all of the other people and it takes longer than a half hour, we're not going to charge you for the first person that's waiting because we're still seeing your other employees. So it's really a half hour after the last person. Uh, after hours, we talked about that. 
Um, it is a $200 flat rate plus mileage as well as the collection fees. Hopefully you don't ever have to incur that fee, um, but sometimes it does happen and we are available. If you need something during business hours, it's a $55 hour per hour plus your mileage and your fees. So I wanted to talk to you about how you wanted to set up your programs because we have different consortiums that we offer. I think you'll end up going with the standalone because currently you're having a situation of being in a, a general consortium with other companies and you were kind of diluting the pool and therefore all of your employees kept getting picked for randoms. So once we separate them out, you'll only be in your consortium with just your employees and you won't be having to have that. You'll know how many employees you have to have tested yes. each quarter. So before we talk about that, this is kind of confusing. So I, that's why I wanted everyone to have a copy of the proposal. But the second paragraph reads, we have a custom built computer program called Test Track. What page do you With a third page, below the bullets, it's the second paragraph. Um, Test Track is a program that we had built um, that keeps track of all of the random selections as well as the individual company and municipality donor history records. The program automatically rounds up to one for the next whole number when randomly selecting because we cannot test for zero or part of a person. Makes sense. The DOT states that recommended rates for testing are minimum rates because occasionally the numbers do not round perfectly. For instance, if you have a small group of people to select from, you may end up testing slightly more than the posted minimum percentage. So you only have six DOT guys, and that means you really only need to do less than one of them for an alcohol, but with the program, you're going to end up testing four for the year, one for each quarter, because it's going to round up. Um, if you were to, so let's talk about the standalone consortium benefits. It's available for both DOT and non-DOT. You can select the testing percentage rates. So for the firefighters that didn't have a CDL endorsement, you wanted to select a, a slightly lower rate than the DOT, that's fine. If you want to select it 20% for drugs and 10% for alcohol, we have companies that test for 20% for drugs and 20% for alcohol. Because they say their theory is that alcohol is just as bad as the drugs. So they want equal rates. So you get to choose those rates for any of your non-DOT groups. It's helpful with budgeting, as you will know in advance, how many people will be tested for the year. And more, it's more effective than a general consortium because your employees are the only employees in the consortium. So one or more will be selected each quarter and then they're less likely to use drugs and risk being caught. If they're in a general consortium, they say, I may or may not be selected, so I'm gonna just try it and hope for the best. So it's really much more effective program when you're in your own pool because you know that somebody's going to be selected from your group. If you do want to go to the general consortium, there are some pros and cons. Like I, it's available for DOT and non-DOT. We have a small consortium for our non-DOTs. It has about 17 companies with over 50 employees total. And it's steadily growing uh, because we have companies that are popping up saying, hey, I have someone who drives a smaller tow truck for me, they don't meet the DOT regulations, but we still want to test them. But it's just the one guy, so we put them into our non-DOT consortium. Um, then in our uh, general DOT consortium, we have uh, over 190 companies, and there are over 500 employees in that consortium currently. The set random testing rates are the same as DOT for the non-DOT, so 50% for drugs and 10% for alcohol. With this general consortium, your employees may or may not be selected each quarter, and that's what you're doing now with Conquer Hospital. Companies may be terminated from the general consortium for not completing their testing, as this will adversely affect the companies in the consortium. I do not 
like when companies don't complete the random testing because it makes it so that we have to select additional drug tests for the next quarter to make up for those companies and that is not fair to the companies that do their random testing. So we have no issue terminating companies in the consortium that don't complete their testing so that they're not affecting the other clients. We take a lot of pride in making sure that our random testing is completed. So like I said, most of the municipalities will choose the standalone option because it allows for easier budgeting. And you decide what the percentage rates are. So you can predict the number of random tests for the whole year. It's very easy to switch over to us. All you have to do is give us a statement saying that you're moving your employees over to our consortium. We pick up where they left off. You're not duplicating any testing that you've already done this year. Um, let's see. Uh, we do offer this new consortium for firefighters that are on call. I don't know how you currently handle them going out to do random drug screens. Do they get paid? Are they required to do it on their own time? Yes? Okay. Um, we've run into some towns that have volunteer firefighters that will not be paid to go to do their drug screens. And so they said, how can we test them? Well, we show up at their meetings, um, that are, we schedule them ahead of time with the chief of the fire department, and we'll go into the meeting. We have a spreadsheet that we set up using Excel, and we do a random selection of the people that are actually at the meeting. Um, and we'll do some randoms right then. The cons to that, you need to think about the fact that who's going to show up to the meeting. If they think that I might be there, then they're not going to show up to the meeting if they don't know if we're going to pass. <laughs> However, it's still a deterrent. If you see the same person not coming to the meeting, well, there's probably a reason why. So, But that option is there, but since you do pay, I don't think that you're going to need to use that. To fulfill the DOT requirements for supervisory training, we will need to have at least one of your supervisors complete the training. The training is to teach anyone that gives safety sensitive instructions, such as Chris, to the DOT employees how to recognize possible substance abuse or intoxication at work. In essence, it gives your supervisors the accreditation needed to respond to a suspected employee should they have a question. Um, obviously, we suggest more than one supervisor to complete the training. And for your non-DOT employees, it's probably a good idea as well. Because, um, like I said, you're going to run into the same scenarios with one type of employee that you will with the other. And we do offer group rates for that. So if you get above six people, then, then we can talk about that. But it's a per-person rate of $105. It's a three-hour course. Um, and we talk about the different substances that you're testing for how to handle the situation, and what you're looking for from your employees. You know, are they constantly late? Are they their change in appearance? You can talk about that. The other thing that it does is, like, we did Bristol. They had four or five of the firemen officers go to the class. The simple reason that they're going to make a call on a firefighter on a Saturday afternoon with a fire who's been drinking, and he's approached and said, what gives you the right? Tell me that I've been drinking. Now you've got something to stand on on the town side. They've had the training, they can make the call. Mm -hmm. So it's not just hearsay or guessing. It's there and it's grounds to stand on. It's the same course that the federal DOT has their people do. So it follows right on their guidelines. So we recommend it for non DOT situations as well. For anywhere that you're going to have a random program. necessarily call this on the spare of the moment. It may be over a period of a week or two weeks or whatever. You see certain things happen with that employee, late for work, uh, the way they dress, uh, certain, so on, you know, odd things like that. So if you can get two people to concur and meet this person, then you've made a real honest judgment call when the time comes. So it's very important to look at that training. And we can do it here as well. So let's 
let's just talk about the pricing and then we're pretty much completed. Um, so your first consortium is your six DOT guys, Chris. Um, it would require, if you have them in the standalone consortium, which I'm assuming that you would really like to go with, because it helps you um, It would be for four drug screens a year, so $100 a drug screen, plus your four alcohol screens, so you're looking at six, six for, for your program. And also remember, if you would hire people, you know approximately how many people you might hire in a year, and always take into consideration that you may have an accident. So, if you take into consideration those two aspects plus your randoms, you're probably a little bit more than 664 for the year. Your second consortium are your 36 non DOT firefighters with CDL licenses, and your police are also in that consortium because you want them selecting at the 50% for drugs and 10% for alcohol. You're looking at 18 drug screens and four alcohols for the year, and that adds up to $2,064 for the whole year. And remember, we do four random selections per year. So those 18 drug screens and four alcohols, those are split into four quarters, okay? Because we want you to have consecutive drug testing throughout the entire year. You don't want to do all of your drug testing in January and not have anything for the rest of the year, okay? Your third consortium is going to be your non-DOT firefighters without a CDL endorsement and probably the employees that drive a company vehicle um, and so on. And we're looking at four drug screens and, f and we're going to add the alcohol. I wasn't sure if you did currently, so I didn't put that in here. So 400, uh, you're basically looking at the same as your, D as your DOT pool, so 664 um, instead of the 400 because we will add the alcohol in. But remember, you can change those rates of testing for the Consortium 2 and the Consortium 3. If you want to start out at a higher rate and see if you have any issues throughout the year, then next year at a town meeting you vote and you reduce the rate if you don't have any issues. Drop it to, you know, 30% or, or something like that. Okay? So you have that to work with on both Consortium 2 and 3. And then your annual fee, it drops, like I said, after the first year to 220. So you're looking at a grand total of about $3,300, $3,400 with the alcohols. And that's what we have for you. Do you have any questions about drug testing in general or about your programs?
go along the other way. Well, we can take body hair. Body hair goes back here. <laughs>
puts it all right back on the doctor. Because remember, you know, we have to be negative, if you will, about people what abusing does? drugs, okay? That's what our job is, to protect you. But there are people out there that have to, are, they live on a pain clinic. So they have to take these medications in order to live. Right. You've been on the medication for 30 years of your life it, and, and you are reg, do regular jobs and you do regular things and you live using this prescription. So the doctor is going to give you a note that says that you're perfectly fine to work and operate machinery because you've been on the substance for so long and you're controlled. So there is that side of it. Yeah. Dave was looking for a direct answer to his question. If you had 100 people on the regular DOT and 100 people on the expanded, mm -hmm. would you get more positives on the expanded than you would the DOT? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 But that's on the DOT that's the, DOT right. the other side is you're going to get positives for your opiate family mm -hmm. branches, if you will. Suboxone, methadone, oxycodone. Thank you. Okay. Sure. And one other thing I wanted to bring up for you when I came up to visit with Chris and talked about the plan, there was a clarification that I told him that I would go to federal DOT in Concord, which I did. And I asked for their guidance and interpretation on fire truck usage so that there was no question. The operation of fire trucks and rescue vehicles while involved in an emergency and related operations you are exempt from. DOT and Concord Federal said related operations includes anything with that vehicle. To and from, to mechanics, to the maintenance department wherever, to that's a relation of the fire department's job and the emergency vehicle. So if you've got a gentleman that's driving that truck to Patsy's in Concord or wherever, that's fire-related, so they're not going to block you. That's the exemption. So to the fire, back to the fire. That's all part of the fire. I'd like to give a bit of a, a little bit of an overview, um, both in terms of some of the history and, and make sure that we get to the history of this project, uh, the purposes of it, uh, 
where we are in the timing of things, um, the involvement and upcoming opportunities for involvement and input. Um, I'd like to get your questions and concerns about this and if you've got support for it. Um, and if you and want to finish up on with steps that could be taken um, by the community, further steps to be taken, what we'll be asking of you, um, the select board, as well as um, planning board, conservation commission, and any other groups that might have an interest, groups or individuals that might have an interest in the nomination process. Um, and there are, there may be a couple of details that come up to touch base on. Um, so, the as you as you recall, uh, in the fall, I came to you along with um, the rivers commit the rivers coordinator from New Hampshire DOT, Jack Colburn, and we talked a bit about the program, what the Rivers um, Management Protection Program is, um, and why the Sun Cook is being proposed for nomination or nominated, uh, while we're working on nomination to designate it for that program. Uh, it is a program that was set up uh, in the late 1980s uh, to provide <coughs> some, some state attention uh, to, the, to the river, um, as well as ensuring that there is local input. Um, there, there, were, there were programs prior to this that did not have that local input component. And so this is a, this is a partner sort of protection in a sense, but also an opportunity for um, enhancing uh, visibility of the rivers. Um, there, a, there is an eight-step process that's, that's pointed out on the second page of, of the colored sheet that I hand that second set of pages. Um, in the fall, um, we had there had been activity um, in the in the southern portion of the river. Down, um, of course, the Epsom uh, disaster that uh, associated with the Mother's Day flood, where the river changed course, um, and the the history of the Suncook River is that it has. It does change, and it, it, it can change pretty rapidly in its flow. And there was a group set up among public safety personnel, town leaders, and, uh, in, in the five communities downstream um, from, from Pittsfield down to Allenstown and Pembroke. Uh, Looking, looking at a number of issues associated with the river, and one of the one of the things that they recommended was trying to nominate the river for designation. That process was begun. Um, the towns north of there, Barnstead and Gilmington, were approached and asked, you know. But this is this is a regional sort of thing. We'd like you to participate. Um, could you have some? Would you like to have some representation on this nomination committee? And you designated um, the chair, Dave Kerr and Earl Chase, and they've been attending um, monthly meetings since November, since October, I guess. Um, on this, um, and this included a public information session in December, on December 8th, uh, down in Chichester. Um, we, the regional planning commissions, 
Lakes Region Planning Commission and our partner, Central New Hampshire Planning Commission, have been working to collect information for the, that is required in the nomination document. Um, and that is being developed and, sh and a draft of that should be available in the next, in about 10 days from now uh, for public review and comment. Uh, and we're getting ready for a public, <coughs> another public information meeting um, on April 18th. Um, and by regulate, by uh, according to the uh, statutes, we are sending out uh, notifications about that meeting to all the landowners along the river um, and are sending out a letter to a letter and, and some uh, poster to each of the boards in the towns. Um, and that would, that nomination will be, input will be taken on that and there, then the state will have, uh, an op they will hold another public information session to ensure that there is public input. And what the, a lot of what the nomination uh, document does is asks for what are the important features about the river. And, and that varies. Um, in some cases, there's, protect, there's already land that's protected. Uh, there may be wonderful stands of certain types of uh, vegetation. There might be uh, historical dams or historical mills. Um, there might be great walking <coughs> trails, uh, snowmobile trails that go, by, that go near it, um, fishing sites, that sort of thing. Um, I know that downstream, they've got some dams, and those are things that are being documented. Um, and we've had a good deal of uh, input from all of the representatives on this nomination committee. Uh, there are two representatives from each of the seven communities. Uh, once input comes in, uh, and it's reviewed by DES, uh, they, as I said, they will get input um, in the, the, the document needs to be in to DES by June 1st. Uh, and then uh, there's opportunity for public input, for public comment on it. Um, and they will send it on to the legislature. Legislature, if, if, it, if there is a sponsor, if there's a local sponsor. And one of the things that they really look for is is there local support for this? And then if there is, they'll, they'll move it along. It, as it's pointed out here, um, it, it needs to be uh, voted on by the legislature and signed by the governor. And then uh, this is all related to, there is an RSA 483 that, that addresses this. And it lists out all of the 18 rivers and segments in the state um, that already have been designated. Um, and as, as is pointed out on the next next page, there's, uh, you know, some of the features I've already mentioned, hydro tower, boating, fishing, wildlife habitat, history, drinking water. There are several communities downstream that their, their public water supply is the aquifer that's associated with Sunfoot River. Uh, there's, uh, there are several dams downstream. Um, one of the things that this group <coughs> has been doing, uh, they looked at, was the, you can designate certain, there are four different types of uh, classification of river segments. Um, what natural, rural, rural community, and community, and there were there was some discussion as to what is the most appropriate for different segments. 
Um, and through discussion, we, we uh, came to agreement that the rural community designation is most appropriate throughout all of Barnstead. Um, and uh, we have that down. Uh, by the way, the corridor, the corridor for the river extends, the designated corridor extends 1,320 feet on either side of the high river, high water mark uh, that's outlined in the purple there. Uh, and uh, that's a quarter mile on either side. So that would be the, the area that is being designated, a quarter mile on either side of the river. Um, in certain conditions. On yeah. those boats and aquatic vehicles, are there any restrictions on uh, two stroke motors? No. I haven't read it. Yes. Yeah, Park River Planning Board. Uh, what you were just talking about, all the restrictions that Andy was talking about, is that in the corridor or strictly in the river? That's in the river corridor. This is the river corridor. That's a quarter mile from the river. I understand that, but this, this picture that you have in this handout, the, the Sunbrook River corridor yes. includes Sunbrook Lake up in Hall. Right. We we in discussion with Wilmington, they their their the boundaries were changed and they're reflected on this and basically it stops at the at the dam at the uh, uh, some, at the Lower Lake Dam at the at the uh, the dam up in Wilmington Crystal Lake Dam. So it does include the sun. Yes, it does include the Sun Coast Rivers, the Sun Coast Lake. Okay, so now you're saying that, that it's going to be limited to boat, boat yes. usage on Sun Coast Lakes if this goes through? Yes. Within 150 feet. Yes. Six miles an hour. And what is it currently? What's the restriction currently? There's nothing. Well, there's no there's no uh, yes. Yeah, there, there is a, there is a similar 50 feet. No water on most does, does all that we've been talking about to this point and the restrictions that we've been talking about to this point and further in our discussions <clears throat> have to do with strictly the river where it comes out at the end of the <laughs> Wow, you said that boating within within this whole thing is going to be restricted to so, uh, six, six miles an hour. That's right. No. Yes. Within the shore. 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 Within the Okay. And right now, the connection covers the whole industrial area. Right? And there's a possibility whether it might happen or not, we might get a business thing or a steel or whatever, but we got to make sure that we're up going in there, we can run the wind. There's a system. That's why I really would like the plan for the map. <laughs>
there are there are some differences with that. Um, I believe this this handout was was passed out. Yeah. Um, so instead of right now it's, it's being looked at as a rural community, it might be that community designation might be more appropriate. What if this is there isn't, there isn't, as you look at this, you're right. Um, uh, but if, if I go back to the RSA, um, there, are, there are some online differences. Uh, and part of that certainly does have to do with dams, right? Not a critical part of there. Septic 75 feet, yeah. mm -hmm. which that still falls by the there. That's the sure. Yeah. Yeah. This really doesn't. I was just worried about something that could affect what you're saying. Yeah. Because you know, it's a very controlled control business in this town. So yep. Yeah. I'd like to see some business in town. Exactly. And the intent of this is yeah. not to uh, step on. Uh, it doesn't step on or nullify local zoning. Yeah. Um, and, you know, where the river flows through uh, down at Center of Pittsfield uh, and, you know, Allen's down that area, it's not. See, I think Allen's Town is looking to designate their section the section through most of their town uh, as a community um, designation. Well, not Pepper, Pepper, I believe so. Not that I need to know. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, extend what you said, David. That we're not adding additional layers of laws and, and governance here then why have it at all? We already have a very 
Comprehensive Shoreline Protection Act, which protects our river. The Suncook already falls under that jurisdiction. We already locally have a very comprehensive drinking water act that the town enacted a few years back that protects our aquifer and water. Um, and the DES governs and has layers of protection how you use the land next to the river. Why are we adding another layer of regulations whereby the government can't even enforce what they're regulating now? This is my question to Mr. Jeffers. A big part of it is the opportunity for this local advisory committee, which would represent this community as well as all the other communities up and down the corridor, to have input in terms of A, developing a uh, river corridor management plan, which would make uh, recommendations uh, regarding steps that, that locally you might take uh, for addressing concerns that you locally see. Um, and secondly, when someone, when the state, the federal government, local government um, is looking to do a project, is, is planning a project, that body, that local advisory committee gets an opportunity to provide input. <coughs> They're not making a decision right. on it. They're advisory only. <coughs> They're advisory. So that what they say will not really matter in the final decision. Uh, yes. No. I I would say no. Yes, I would say that what they that they're what I have seen in working with the Pemina Jawasa River Group. Okay. Um, DES does take that into concern. Take that into uh, uh, advisement. They also any any time someone now would have to and a, a business or a private group would be doing a shoreland permit, a wetlands permit, uh, a dredge and fill type permit, then they would normally send it to the state. They also just make a copy of it and send it to the so local another, la another layer of bureaucracy yeah. for a potential project for an end user would have to go through. It's not, it's only <coughs> what I have in my discussions with wetland scientists, uh, some of which are on this, on the nomination committee. Uh, who have worked in other parts of the state where they've had to do projects. Uh, they've said it's not, yes, it's making a copy. It's not a new so form. They're, it's, it's, it's informed, not a they're informed form. only. It's, it, it's informing the local group of what's happening. Um, you, just, you just said too that it could react to the state decide. It could. But they're going to advice from it because if, if uh, say, this board, our planning board, are not authorizing somebody to move in and they have all the planned wetlands, wetlands agreed with them and everything else, it could take a monkey wrench from the committee to throw the whole thing out the window. May I? Because somebody might not like somebody on or what they're doing. So, I'm not going to, it's not a bureaucracy. Sure. I, you can always find something like that. My experience, again, my experience in working with the group in the town of Jalassa that works from Franklin up through Thornton. Uh, uh, town of New Hampton just recently built a, uh, a their municipal, their new municipal fire station. Um, and it's all for one of four. Spit to the river from there. Um, on a nice parcel of land up on a bluff, they did need to, they realized part way through, oh, we need to uh, notify the Pamela River Local Advisory Committee. They did, the chair and, uh, and local representative came out really on a moment's notice. Uh, 
talk, did a site walk, talked with the folks, exchanged ideas, and it moved forward. Um, and likewise, um, up in uh, when PSU was putting in their new hockey rink, there was input, there was a, an opportunity to exchange ideas. Did he has taken into account all of their recommendations? No. But there was dialogue, and it was an opportunity. Uh, and the builder can take, if you do it ahead of time, the builder can take in, the developer can take into account some of the local concerns. Yes, sir.
a couple communities, and then the southern 11, communi uh, 11 communities are part of it. Um, those communities have opted not to participate in it. Um, the river still does now fall under the I just wanted to say, I lived in Epping for four months, and I was, when I grew up, they were on the uh, Lamprey River, mm -hmm. and it was a pain for me. I had a screen house down there, so my wife could go read books, they told me I had to tear it down. Uh, they told me I, it was like a swollen hill down, and I couldn't go get the neighbors cow and a husband or and throw it all over my bushes and stuff they advised me not to because it would leach into the river. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't too thrilled with it. I had to take down a, a swing that the, my grandkids went across the river and they made me take that down. So. Because of designation? Yes. yes. Like that's when the road became a designated river. I, it wasn't a big deal, but I felt it was my land, and they were a little big deal. That's me. Yeah. I guess one more question. Yes, Why can't? Well, we already have a wetland raft. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that through your regulations in here, instead of making it stricter, where you can just Wetlands that, as far as distances that we have now, so instead of making them bigger, and they're just changing the fact that many people will like, then maybe you can have a big argument problem based on it. Which means we have to deal with wetlands that, we have to do anything in the water, we go by the way, the way that rule, the rules are right now, leave them alone, don't make them that means you can still protect the waters. We can still protect them, but yeah. still allow what we already have. Without changing it, making it more strict. Every time in the, that's what you guys are doing, making this more strict than what the wetland is about. Some landowners that have needed right to use the water. How will this designation affect their use? Um, you're you're talking about extracting water for yes. use in, in farming. Yes. Um, will that go away, or will that not be affected? Um, it probably. I can't. There is one element in here called the in-stream flow. Um, it's being, uh, it, and the idea behind in-stream flow is to protect the, the various uses along the river, uh, along rivers. What type of uses would you define as various uses? It, if, it could be agriculture. So the one, the one I just described, okay? What well, else, what else the, would be the various uses? The fishing. Okay. Um, uh, Water, if, it, if it's being used for water supply, for drinking, drinking water, water, or, okay. or uh, sewage systems in any way, I don't think I don't that think it so. is yeah. along this river. Um, uh, boating, swimming, mm -hmm. recreation, um, and there are there is there is language in the RSA. The, RSA 483, which addresses this whole program. Um, and 
it, it, set, it speaks to in-stream flow programs, uh, an in-stream flow program. And the state is piloting two programs. They're doing studies that were, um, they were directed by the state legislature to do these multi-year studies down on the Ex Exeter and Cochico rivers to figure out what are the uses that are that that are being used. How can how can you begin to not control that, but get a sense of what the needs are in conjunction with the natural flow of the river. Rivers go through periods of high water load. Sure, water. sure, sure. Um, but <coughs> one of the aspects of this is it it says categorically water cannot be taken out of the the watershed the river watershed area. Mm -hmm. So for right. example, you're not taught, you're not shipping water right. down right. to Portsmouth. And okay. again, and again, that's our no. local regulations. Any our local regulations protect that too. So it stays within our aquifer. This so is, yeah. So again, back to my question: How will this designation, and what is this going to do to farmers, agricultural users who depend on that water and have a right to that water, as deeded? Right. Is it, or is it not going to affect it? Well, it. I can't say. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. But it. What I can say is that the idea of the in-stream flow program will will take into account, yes, there are, there, there's maybe some agriculture in Barnstead that is taking water out, but there may also be agriculture downstream in Allenstown, mm -hmm. uh, and <coughs> who, who gets the most who gets the right? Is it the first one in with their hose in the Or is it divided equally? So we know there's, what, 9.4 million gallons going past my house in a 24-hour period. So you take that and you start calculating, you're going to get this, you're going to get that, and that's how this is going to go with that. Proper. Okay. And then you can't water the environment anymore. Well, we're going to be allowed so many gallons, and that'll be it. There'll be some in the monitor. How are you going to monitor it? Don't ask me. I've been, been, been pumping my garden from the river across here for 20 years. I can't. Of course, that's not going to be in it. Actually, it is because it falls within a quarter mile of that river that's going to overflow the river. Wow. The protection area <coughs> will overflow Bigger River, which is a quarter mile away from mm -hmm. the Pumper River. And that's why I pump my water. Well, I, 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 I've not been involved in the science of the of the in-stream flow program. I do know that they are they've been doing pilot work down in the Chico and the Exeter to understand what the what the various uh, flow regimes are through there um, and get a sense of what's happening and the. <coughs> they are. They will be publishing uh, the presenting this at the end of this year <coughs> to the legislature, and the legislature will make some decisions about what to do in the next two to two to ten years. That's going to be interesting. They, they, I don't. Uh, I don't really know if there's any flow that's that's controlled by. It's not, it's not regulating, it's, but it does, I don't want to try and say it's not in there, but there is right. language in there speaking to... They're going to address, they're really going to address how that water is going to whether you're going to be allowed to use that water, because it's, it's a different layer of protection. And he has to be, I think, he answered that. <coughs> there could be, and if there could be, it possibly will be. 
The river, the river does flow through. I mean, Crystal Lake is the headwaters of, of the river. Yeah. It's fed by a stream. Well, uh, okay. I wouldn't call it a quote unquote river. But the. But the but they are connected by water. But if you use that analogy, Feet on each side. Of them. Oh, sure. you know, if you're including those, then uh, I guess the, my the, original question though was this: Is there some way we could designate "quote unquote" the river and not the lake? In other words, can we can, and, which wouldn't mess up <coughs> the situation very much, but can you like designate from the dam on the Sun Cook Valley and the dam? <laughs> could, you, could you say like from, could we designate like from Valley Dam down to the Pittsfield line as a rural community river? Because I have to be honest with you, I haven't seen anybody out there in speedboat. Most of them are traveling. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, you want to go down there and pass I know that they have I, I know that people go out there and fishing boats and kayak and you know uh, but I haven't really seen is there some way to just to designate that without going into the lakes or not? There may be. Um, it, it, I mean, the the desert, just as just as the in discussions with the nominating committee, there were originally the concept had been to include all of Crystal Lake. And the nominating committee said, well, no, that's not the, that that would be hard to do. I just um, want to relate the whole thing. Right. You got but, to push the lake uh, up here. Up here. Up here. So now we'll just use right. the point of And then you've got um, the lake.
very well likely. It, it's only a thought. Because well, there, there is a link to using the crystal light. Sure. But that's the beginning of the whole thing. Right. That's yeah. something that's sort of half and all. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beginning of something like right? Chichester Town Hall. Um, and the time on that? So when that okay. no, uh, what, what time is that meeting? Um, 6.30? I believe it's it 6.30. Uh, there are notices are being sent out. So it's not at the Central School, it's at Town Hall. Notices are being sent out this week to all the planning board Conservation Commission and select. Did you get a notice? And no, I just. They're, they're all dealing with people on the river. Okay. They're also going out to uh, all of the riparian, all of the riverfront landowners. So, so we'll be getting letters in the mail. Yes, we will be. That's a That's a question. Yes, if we're not on top of it. How far in advance are you supposed to be notified? Two weeks. We 
have to take a step to get to the nominated. These are the nominated. Yeah. You take it. You take it. All Who's on the nominating committee? I'm sorry, this is my first meeting. Well, this, <coughs> I know that some folks have been, been bent out of shape, but they haven't known about this. There, there, have, there were folks in the planning board <coughs> that didn't come to the, the initial meeting. Uh, there were Barnstead folks who did come to the December 8th or 18th meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there were two or three Barnstead people. There were more Barnstead people than, than some of the other towns. Um, there's a, uh, So yes, the nomination elected nominating committee uh, from, from Barnstead, your representatives are Dave Kerr and Earl Chase. Okay. We did request uh, requesting people who were interested in this. I don't I remember this. Right. I just didn't know. <coughs> <remember. coughs> I don't remember. Right. 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 Yeah. Check I mean, we ended up with Earl. What about the rest of us on the river? Well, you know, you have, you have to talk yeah, about the rest of the landowners on the river. If you designated the river itself without my, taking into the lake, where do you think that's going to impact? My whole property will fall in this zone. The whole town so, town some, so someone on a state level right. is going to tell me how to use my property. That's what's going to happen. <coughs> that's what I see is going to happen in the future. Yeah. And if you eliminate the lakes, isn't that discriminatory, the fact that now it falls on my shoulders? And everybody no, I I, But that would include the whole parade area anyway. The port, well, that's right? what I'm saying, okay. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else living yeah. out there? Dave's property? No, I agree. Dave, too, would be affected. Anybody that has a motorboat on there, so only on that segment of river, is going to be limited to six miles per hour. They should be anyway in the state law. But there's wider sections there, David. But now it's gonna it's gonna definitely play that. Well, I, I just need a lot more information on that. I do too, but what I'm starting to see is <clears throat> is not very good for the future. I will tell you my plan, if it was up to me right now, I just wouldn't go for it. Thank you.
mistaken, um, I, I'd like to encourage you to stay involved. Um, there's the process. We are working through a process. We do, as I've mentioned before, we want to get input. There will be opportunities for more input, uh, both <coughs> and against, uh, both and Do you have a question, Mr. Now, I'm just going to say, I'm here uh, representing the Conservation Commission. Jim Fu here, the chairman, couldn't be here tonight. Yeah. And I haven't been involved in a uh, process of getting this before. So I'm learning that I've read through this. And it's, I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't realize the importance of, of clean water and taking care of our water. That's not the issue. The issue is another layer of governmental regulation. And you know, it's our, it's our responsibility, the Christian's responsibility to help safeguard the natural resources of the town. So um, we'll probably have a good discussion about this tomorrow. But my question is, how does the committee, how does the two representatives of Barnstead know how the town feels? How are you going to know? Uh, it's this nomination committee that puts forth the nomination. And how are you going to know how the town feels? How do we get to that point? Yeah. Yeah, but this is the only public hearing you're going to have before you go to the road. Uh, well, I'm not going to get another one in Barnes that uh, Well, we had the presentations here, the presentation here before, and it was the, the public hearing. It wasn't enough. Uh, certainly, it's certainly being uh, heard now. And, and there are six members of the planning board. Right. So yeah. Thursday night, this is all This is all the we had. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, and maybe the, one of the advantages would be that you might be more eligible for governmental grants, which yep. seem to be drying up. Right. But right. there, you know, there's supposedly your spin this is a much there's much more opportunity for help with planning. Exactly. And planning's good. We all plan every day. We plan. We need to plan. We need to um, select and do it every day. Um, but I don't, I don't really see, you know, since it's this committee that's supposed to be helping with planning and, and produce a plan for the watershed. That's not an easy thing to do from a bunch of volunteers. But um, well, I'll bring it before the commission and I'll try to get some kind of response back to uh, to you, Mr. Kerr, and, and and to Mr. Chase, so that uh, at least you know how the committee feels. That would help you. Yeah, my, my thinking on this was at least once the once it was nominated, assuming it was, then the real work would be with this the, uh, local, the local commission that would be created. Then that's going to be any decisions or plans that's, that's when that's done. There's an awful long process of before it's actually designated, so there's plenty of opportunity to um Right through the legislative action. Thank you. If, if after if after consideration and discussion and uh, talking about things, uh, we will be asking for letters of support, both from the selectmen as well as conservation commission planning board. Uh, if you find that. That's something that you can do as the as you see the document, the designation move forward, and if it's something that you can support, we'll be at, we will be asking for your support and would appreciate.
Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> People go to sell their houses, their camps, especially in these times, they're having enough trouble trying to sell. Now you put another restriction on, on that body of water, and I want to expound on this, and I don't only mean the lake, I mean the whole river, because there's people that have cottages on a lot of homes along the river too. So it goes, it goes to them that that is another hindrance in them, one, selling that piece of property, and number two, getting even a relatively fair price for it. It's a restriction, another restriction in the sale of a piece of property for the use of your own property. Twofold statement in there, didn't I guess. So I, I understand where you're coming from on to leave the lake out, but I feel just as bad for the people along the river that might want to sell or use their, their property as they're using it now without these additional restrictions. My purpose in saying about the lake mm. was that it really, in my, just my opinion, and I wouldn't have any of the other, I'm sorry, <coughs> but it, it may also include other bodies of water mm. that filter into the river, that go to the river or are connected to the river by another body of water, which is exactly what is happening in Crystal Lake. So my reason for mentioning that about the mm. was, well, if you're going to designate the river, then let's see what the restrictions are going to be and, and go from there. That's why I, I, you know, anyway, I, that, 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 I, that's why I was saying, I think, maybe it's just my own thought, but I, I think if you just left it, that <coughs> I have no problems about designating a, a short drive area. My problem is making it more stricter than what it already is. If it stayed right where the shoreline protection center and was no more infusive into the people's properties and their lives, uh, leaving the boat the way they boat already, leave everything the way it is, but you can still protect what's there. Does that make any sense? I don't know if it does or not, but that's, you're still protecting it. I, I'd like to comment on, the, on Clark's uh, comment about property values. The, there is another uh, unintended consequence of that when it affects property values. When property values go down, the town loses from the standpoint that they don't get as much revenue, which means that the only way that they get more revenue is to raise the tax rate to, to compensate for that, something else to take in, in, into account. The other thing uh, that I have a question for you about has to do with uh, moorings, people wanting to put up uh, docks for their boats. Um, what what is the impact on on all of them? Are there are there going to be more regulations in regard to putting in things of that nature? I've not read of any of those. I'm not aware of any of those. Okay. You have to what you go through. Yeah. If you need in, if you're doing any building. I'm Lake water and dig on a hole, you have to get permission. Well, that that's not part of that's that's part of the state yes, state yes, state 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 state. Yes. and I that's not part of this. Uh, this is you you yes, that was part of before the shore yes, shoreland. That's that was sh that shoreland. No, 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 I have the property before we had the shoreland. Thing. Before you had the 250, <clears throat> uh, that just came in about a year ago. The 250, the 500 was here. I mean, the 50 feet was here for a long time, but the 250 feet just came in. Well, it was a mod. That was a modification of the comprehensive shoreline protection, mm -hmm. right? yep. and, which which does impact all of the Sunset River already. Um, so what do we need? And, but what I'm saying is that I didn't have that and they were, all we had was going into the, making it a designated <coughs> river. So, and they, they came down with, there was quite a few, uh, I know I had a screen house and they had to take it down. Well, who was they? But, yeah. Who was they? Who was they? Uh, the people that were contacting the advisory committee? Yes. I, I don't know. This was already, it was already in effect because I had just kind of ignored it. And then when they finally did, they came and told me. 
and they told me to take down that screen house, and I couldn't cut any of the things down there. They told me I shouldn't have the uh, manure that went, might run down into the ground. Okay, that's a good practice for the people who look for the water bottle. Yeah, that was quite a ways away. Thank you. 